Ahead on Frontiers, bears in our backyard. Surprising lessons learned from this bear cam footage. And remember what happened at Anchorage's Gold Nugget Triathlon and should you cross paths with these guys? Some pointers on what to do and what not to do. It must have put some of my head maybe in its mouth. It, um, it bit down on my shoulder. Charged by a brown bear and no time to react. How Kenny Steck survived. Every piece of the caribou is here in the, in the bass making. And later, how a tradition began in the 1950s in Anaktuvik Pass and why you won't find it anywhere else. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to our program in which we explore the frontier in our own backyard. Now, we expect to see bears in the wilderness, but they also coexist with humans in the city. Now, usually we get along fine, but sometimes there is a potential for trouble, like at the recent Gold Nugget Triathlon in Anchorage, when a black bear and her cubs crossed paths with competitors, and they had to make some quick decisions. All of this caught on video in what KTVA's Joe Vigil saw as a teachable moment. Okay, so here come the bears. We've got a person in the green. Now what? We invited fish and game biologist Dave Battle to look at the bear-human encounter to see what people did right and possibly wrong. First, the woman in the green shirt. What about her? She's just standing there. Is that okay or she should have done it, it, something else? No, no, that's fine. Um, uh, what we always tell people is uh, when you're in that close proximity to bears, you should stand your ground. The young bear then runs to her, but she stays put. Battle says another good decision. They have an instinct to chase things that run away from them. You know, uh, things that run away from them are food. So sometimes if, if someone turns and, and runs, they can draw a chase response and, and that could lead to an attack. A battle wants to make it very clear, though, that it would be highly unusual for a black bear to consider us as food. Dave, let's talk about these two people right here. The mm -hmm. woman in the blue and this person right here. They are seen slowly backing away. Now it does appear the young girl turns and jaunts away at one point, but moments later she regroups and is facing the bears once again. Battle says they gave the bears plenty of room to roam. Another good decision. One suggestion from Battle, bear spray. It was hard to see if anyone had it. If they did, he says they should have pulled it out as soon as they saw the mother and her cubs. And says if anyone planned to use it, right here would have been the time. Now we notice something else. Well, she's clapping. Did yeah, you see that? Yeah, she's And the clapping. bear came. What, what do you think mm -hmm. of what happened there? Battle says the clapping should have scared the bear away. He suspects it approached looking for a handout. We can't say for sure, but this it certainly looks like this uh, this cub could have been fed before. The people who did something wrong, if this, if this cub has been fed by humans, the humans that fed it are the ones who did something wrong. Which could mean a rough end for the three bears. So if these bears have been fed and that's how they're conditioned, what do you see as the future for these bears? Uh, dismal. If they continue to approach people, they may have to be removed put down, killed. But overall, high marks for these folks. They didn't panic. They mostly held their ground after the bear spotted them and came in close. In the end, everyone walks away safe. Exactly the way Fish and Game likes these encounters to end. Well, people could see some changes here at the Gold Nugget Triathlon next year because of that incident. Staff tell me they may play some more music along the trail to keep bears away, and there may be more people on bikes to specifically watch out for wildlife. And while bear spray certainly is allowed on the trail, there are no plans to require it. For Frontiers, I'm Joe Vigil. Up next, we'll bring you up to date on some recent bear mauling, some painful lessons learned. I remember thinking, I'm going to die today, and I remember thinking, um, my wife is going to be left without me. 
a bear attack near Yakutat. How a Juno man lived to tell the tale. And remember those government hill bears? We'll revisit that story. Also, an inside look at the secret life of bears caught on camera. Plus, old Alaska, how a homesteader wound up raising his own bears. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium provides comprehensive health services for Alaska Native and American Indian people across our state. In addition to world-class care at the Alaska Native Medical Center, our work delivers health services for rural Alaska. From cutting edge technology for the best care possible, to modern construction of clean water systems and health clinics, to health training and outreach that honors our culture, our vision is that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. Your turn. Your turn. Do you feel anything? She's dancing. Help protect your baby. Download the free Count the Kicks app. Studies show that regularly monitoring a baby's movements helps reduce the chance of stillbirth. Your turn. Count the Kicks. Visit countthekicks.org. I thought I was the only person who didn't know how to drink appropriately. Alcohol was a best friend for years, and eventually it stopped doing that. I just knew I had to quit. I needed to be there for my children. My day one was May 22nd. My day one was... Day one for me. My day one. My day one. Day one. My day, day one, one was, was September 29th, 2007. 2007. This fire roared to life yesterday around 1 p.m. It took a lot of people by surprise. They That's grabbed. where I like to be. I like to be where things are happening, where, where people are. That's just how I am. I just don't want to sit around behind a desk. I mean, I think it's important to actually be out there telling the stories from where the stories are happening. We're about exceptional journalism, and I think we've really proved that. I think we're working hard every single day to achieve that, and that's what you're going to get. Three bear maulings in just six weeks, two of them just days apart. Well, the first one happened on April 15th when a 77-year-old man was attacked near mile 68 on the Denali Highway, about 150 miles north of Anchorage. State troopers say Glenn Bon of Wasilla was bear hunting at the time and suffered significant injuries, but no word on how Bon is doing. His family wants to keep that information private. A professor from the University of Alaska Southeast is on the mend after being mauled by a brown bear in April. After the attack, Forrest Wagner was flown to Providence Hospital in Anchorage. When he left in early May, he thanked everyone for their support during his recovery. Wagner is continuing with outpatient therapy and is said to be making good progress. He was mauled on April 18th during a mountaineering course near Haines. And he is starting to get out again. Here's a recent photo of Forrest and his mother, Marjorie, at the Exit Glacier Overlook outside of Seward. Wagner hopes to return home to Juneau next month. Another Juneau man is healing from an attack one he believes should have killed him. Kenny Steck says he thought he saw the devil's face that day in April, a story he shared with KTVA's Shannon Ballard. Good job, Easter. <sighs> Give you this. With each step, just kind of slow. Kenny Steck is reminded of the time he needed a miracle most. <sighs> Everything's so tight, and it feels like when I walk, it's going to rip, you know? And the morning, one such miracle arrived. I remember thinking, this thing is going to kill me. Unexpectedly, Kenny and his wife Hannah were camping with family on this gravel bar about an hour and a half out of Yakutat. He'd gone to get some water just 200 yards away when he was charged suddenly by a brown bear. I was facing the bear the whole time. Um, as it was running, I just remember the sounds really vividly. I remember hearing it. I remember the sound of it breathing, and I remember, you know, the sound of it snarling. Kenny um, says he didn't have time to react. I had lifted up my leg so the bear had clawed. Um, maybe just, you know what, it was only about a three to four inch section here. His head was in the bear's mouth. One of his fangs had gone right into his head. Um, 
He's got 30 stitches here. My shoulder. Um, the bear also shattered here. Kenny's scapula. And Just ran into his voice yelling at him, and then we heard this crashing through the woods, and the bear had let Kenny go. This is the part where we need you guys. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't get much luckier than this. Four of the people on the trip are nurses. They started first aid immediately. Ellen's also a nurse. So, mm -hmm. so things can be chaotic quick. Kenny feels blessed. I feel completely like God had his hand of protection over me during that day. There are still months of recovery ahead, but Kenny says it could have been much worse. I'm going to be able to walk just fine in a couple months, and I'm already on a crutch, and I'm already able to do things that I thought, you know, I might not be able to do again. He says it's his faith and family. You've been good to me. We called him. Come here. Come here. <laughs> that pushes him on. For Frontiers, I'm Shannon Ballard. As Alaska's urban centers grow, bear research becomes all the more important. And joining us, Sean Farley, a wildlife researcher, and Elizabeth Manning, a wildlife educator, and both work with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. It's Memorial Day weekend, Elizabeth. What are the main things you want people to remember? Well, like um, during all of bear season, um, remember to be aware of bear attractants when you're out camping, secure your food out of reach of bears. Um, make noise, really important in bear country, so bears know you're coming. They do try to avoid us, and uh, being a group is a good idea. Well, Sean, you had a chance to talk with uh, the man we just saw, uh, Kenny. Uh, what did he tell you about his attack that, that's, worth, that's important to share? Well, Kenny summarized it pretty well right there. The, the, the takeaway message that I got was that he more than likely startled a bear. It was the middle of the day. It was quite warm. The bear might have been sleeping. And the bear's reaction was pretty much purely defensive to neutralize the perceived threat, which was Kenny. So the attack was knock him down, bite him real quick. And then the bear took off running and got the Dickens out of Dodge as fast as he could. And, you know, in that sense, there probably wasn't really anything Kenny could have done different. It was just a case of bad luck. Now, what about uh, the Glen Bond ma mauling? Uh, what was the difference between those two? But we don't know much about what's happened there. As you said, the family is trying to keep that fairly private. We do know that the, this was more of a hunting situation, and so, and the bear had been in a den. Whether it was still there or not, I don't know. So, very different circumstances. And when a bear is in a den, is that more dangerous? Well, we go into the dens with black bears all the time, but you don't do it with brown bears. They are much more aggressive, much more defensive, and so it, it could very well be that there was something about that. Well, you know, know, a lot of people um, have notions about bears. They almost sort of anthropomorphize them. I guess that's the term that's used, teddy bears. Uh, uh, you know, they see bears in circuses all the time. Uh, is that a problem? Oh, it's, it, it can be a problem. I mean, we certainly have had cases of people feeding them in town and elsewhere, and, and uh, they're cute looking and they're cuddly, and I've raised bears from cubs to adults, and so I understand the, the feeling. Well, we have footage that we dug up uh, with help from the Alaska Moving Image Preservation Association. This was shot in the 50s, Mortimer Moose Moore. He actually raised bears that were given to him by Fish and Game uh, after an experiment. So, you know, what's the takeaway when you look at something like this? Well, he's clearly enjoying his time with the bears. Um, the, the takeaway for me is that eventually he, he probably will if he wasn't a bit at some point. A lot of people that have fed bears in the wild and had groups of bears coming around end up having injuries from the bears or getting killed by them. So, so we have also some footage of Moose Moore mushing mm -hmm. with a, a bear. <laughs> uh, to me, that's like unbelievable footage. Mm -hmm. well, bears are incredibly smart. They're very, very smart. And I'm sure that, as you see here, they're highly trainable. I mean, we do an awful lot of them with captive bears for research that is uh, for training. So, But what is it that you worry about in those scenarios? They're still wild animals. And if they want something and at some point they decide they want it and you're not giving it to them, they'll probably go ahead and take it. Yeah, and on that note, we do have to remind people in Anchorage all the time not to get too close to bears. They see a bear in the neighborhood and they get excited and want to take a photo. And sometimes they crowd bears and we need to tell them to make sure they give them plenty of space. Well, speaking of bears that we've had uh, close at hand, the Government Hill bears, what happened with this? Now, they were raiding garbage cans, and, and they got removed uh, because the governor gave them a stay of execution. So what was their final outcome? Well, 
that 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 whole incident demonstrated pretty clearly to folks that once bears and particularly black bears get into garbage, you can't break them of that habit. And we moved the bears to a different place, and they still found community that had garbage and unprotected chickens. And authorities had to to kill the bears. So one of the things that you're doing to learn more about bear behavior is using something called a bear cam, and, and you brought the equipment. Uh, can you explain how that works? Yeah, this is an example of one of the collars. It's, it gives us a GPS, GPS location of the animal. It gives us a radio signal so we can track them. And it also records a video image, a still series of images, uh, depending on how it's programmed while the animal is wearing it. And so that gives us insight in the case of the Anchorage bears, it was very helpful in that we could determine how important human food is to bears in Anchorage versus natural foods that are occurring in our green belts and along our trails. And we have some footage that was captured. In fact, uh, the government hill bear, yes. uh, bear 15, was one of those that you were tracking. So here they are, uh, going after the garbage, it looks like. Yeah, there's some... <laughs> In Anchorage, they eat equisetum like you have there and some berries that would be natural foods. And uh, garbage was not the primary food source for them, which tells us that if we actually did secure all the garbage in Anchorage in some perfect way, we'd still have bears because we have enough berries and grass and, and, and seagull eggs and duck eggs and moose calves to feed the bears. And so, and fish, I can't forget the fish. So as long as we have natural foods like that and we have natural green belts and lots of areas, we're going to have bears. Uh -oh. But when they get into stuff like this, that's when they're a problem because that's a huge food resource for that animal right there. So they're going to come back or that 7-Eleven Slurpee mug or whatever it is there. <laughs> Boy, they'll go after just that little bit of sugar, huh? Well, people do. <laughs> <laughs> so, Elizabeth, what... Uh, is the mm. takeaway for you from these bear cam videos and, and does it help in showing them to the public? It, it does help and we've used them a lot in our public outreach. Um, it's one thing to read a brochure about keeping bird seed away from bears but if you actually see a bear high up in a tree um, knocking down a bird feeder people become true believers and really needing to put away their bird seed come April and not putting it back out until November when the bears are back in their dens. I am just struck by their ingenuity at, at getting into things. These bears, we have video of them going into garbage cans, going into garages, opening up the garbage cans. Uh, the bear-resistant containers are a good approach for it, um, but there's varying degrees of resistance. This is a perfect example, of that last one, a bear up in a tree looking at a neighborhood. So, And we're not even sometimes aware. Now, I understand that in Government Hill, um, they've taken steps to secure their garbage a lot better than they were. Yeah, the community up there has been really responsive to what happened and has worked with solid waste services and fish and game. And my understanding is that they're getting bear-resistant um, garbage containers delivered next week. Um, as a pilot project for the neighborhood. I understand that there's an international bear conference coming to Anchorage. Are you excited about that, Sean? It's, it's great to be able to interact with folks from around the world because there's this international uh, bear association for research and management and uh, there'll be close to, I think, four or five hundred participants and researchers and managers and uh, uh, it's four or five days and it's a pretty good place. Now, I understand that the public can attend some of these lectures. Yeah, the conference organizers really wanted to make sure there were opportunities for the public as well to learn about bears and, and from all the researchers that were coming in town. So there's a great lineup of public lectures um, June 13th through the 15th at the Denina Center. Lots of really big names in the bear world um, talking about everything from cultural anthropology to looking at um, bear incidents over the years to bear conservation of some of the species around the world that are in peril. I understand that one of the presenters is another survivor of a bear attack. Can you tell us about uh, this person? Uh, Dan Bigley was mauled down on the Russian River in a pretty horrific mauling several years ago and he's going to give a talk about how he's recovered from that and his, his take on, on bears in, in the wild. I guess that changes you forever, that one encounter. <laughs> oh, yes, it does. If, you can, if you're lucky enough to survive it. What do you take away from these bear survivor stories? Is, is there something that comes to the surface? Well, we always interview them. I interviewed Kenny in the hospital because we want to know what are the circumstances that happen and is there something we can learn from it as an agency to help translate to the public to perhaps avoid having those occur. 
Uh, in the case of like Kenny, there was really nothing he could have done. Other cases, maybe people would learn to behave differently to, to, to prevent attacks from occurring. Now, one thing we didn't get a chance to talk about, because your bear cam video is mostly of, of black bears. How are brown bears and black bears different? Well, the brown bears are much larger. We have both in town. Uh, we, several years ago, did a quickie study and identified probably 30 to 35 brown bears using Bicentennial Park, Campbell Tracks, all the way down to Westchester Lagoon. And uh, we don't know how many brown, black bears, but quite a few. The, the brown bears are, are less, they, they're large animals that get to be large by not being problems as much as the black bears in Anchorage. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we will have a chance to talk more about this uh, in a web extra interview, and we'll talk more about the bear conference and what kind of fun things there might be to attend. So I want to thank you very much for joining us, Elizabeth Manning and Sean Farley with the Department of Fish and Game. Well, switching gears, it's an old tradition in Anaktuvik Pass. I make faces, I mean the eyes. From foot to face, hoof to head, see how mask makers put every part of the caribou to good use. Hi, I'm Randy Richards here at Wasilla Dodge. 41 years in Alaska with 12 years living in Bush, Alaska, I understand the challenges of shopping over the phone and computer. That's why Wasilla Dodge is making shopping for a new or pre-owned vehicle easier than ever. Wasilla Dodge has hundreds of vehicles online at wasilladodge.com. You can view our inventory, fill out an easy online credit app, and call me, Randy Richards, and I'll even help coordinate the shipping. Save big right now on a new vehicle at wasilladodge.com. Hi, I'm Anchorage Mayor Ethan Berkowitz. All this hot, dry weather makes this an unusually dangerous wildfire season. So please, be extra careful this summer in our parks, on our trails, and along our green belts. If you see unattended or illegal campfires, fireworks, or other dangerous fire activity, call 911 immediately. Together we can prevent a major wildfire and keep this beautiful Alaska summer safe. Thanks. This message brought to you by Mayor Ethan Berkowitz and your Anchorage Fire Department. One caring foster parent can make the difference between a good life and a not so good life for a child. What does it take? The willingness to be there. The willingness to care. The willingness to open your heart and your home for one child. One child. One child. Me. Will you be the difference for one child? Call today, 1-800-478-7307. I was really nervous, borderline scared at the starting line at Mount Marathon. And I had done stories about it, I knew the mountain, but these are a whole different breed of runners. These Alaska trail runners, they're serious. To look up and know, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get to the top of that and that feeling when you get to the top. It's changed my family's lifestyle because now we're out climbing mountains every weekend and there's just always somewhere new to go, somewhere else to explore another mountain to climb. Next week, some food for thought. Work with nature, but let's, um, let's use our heads for something other than a hat rack. Bernie Carl of China Hot Springs likes to think of himself as a visioneer. Yes, tourists come here to enjoy the natural hot springs, but China is also a hotbed for experimentation. And Carl says what happens in his greenhouse could someday help our state. How about if we were to have enough food growing in Alaska, no matter what happened, we could take care of Alaska? Think about that a minute. Carl says Alaska's food security is more fragile than we realize. Long before the Nunamut people settled in Anaktuvik Pass, they followed the caribou, which still feeds both body and soul. Heather Hensey takes us to the North Slope, to the place where a new technique for making caribou masks was born. I have a scraper to scrape the skin. It's an intricate art form Leela Aguk has honed over time. Here's the first thing for her. After it's dry, I make faces, I mean the eyes. At 72, she's now an elder in Anaktuvik Pass, where she started making caribou masks in the 1960s. Every piece of the caribou is here. The eyelashes, the 
hoof, and this is the roof, roof tail. The art is unique to the North Slope community. Two trappers began the custom as a way to do something different with their leftover skins. Now it's a way to bring in money to the struggling village. That's why I'm trying to make masks for, for tourists, you know, wishing I, I could get some income. My retirement doesn't help me out too much. But Leela says the number of tourists coming to Anaktuvik Pass has dropped over the past few decades. The village is tucked in the gates of the Arctic National Park, which is scenic but hard to get to. Around town, it's easy to see how important caribou are to the people here. Once nomadic hunters who followed the herds, now they're at the mercy of the animals' migration patterns. When I was young, we used to uh, see the caribou herds passed through the pass, you know, and they were by the thousands. And um, right now we don't even see any. So it's been pretty bad and hard for our people. If one of our families gets a caribou or a moose or something, they make sure everybody gets a piece to eat. No caribou not only means a lack of food for the village, but a lack of supplies for native artists. Leela is using old skin she stockpiled when the hunting was better. Her frames were made by her father more than 50 years ago, and she's put them to good use making masks over the years. Millions. <laughs> the art form is in danger of dying off if more young people don't learn from their elders. Leela's granddaughter Josie says that's why she wanted to continue the tradition. Growing up, I was one of the only ones that a lot of interest in this kind of stuff. I'm very proud to be in your belt. From the hoof to the head, every piece plays a key role in making sure these masks capture what the Nunamut culture is all about. For Frontiers, I'm Heather Hinsey in Anaktuvik Pass. You can find Leela's mask at the museum in Anaktuvik Pass. She also hopes to sell them at the Alaska Federation of Natives Conference this fall. Well, thank you for joining us to explore yet another fascinating frontier of those bears right in our own backyard. We leave you now with the sights and sounds of dancing from Anaktuvik Pass.